Unmute and open it up. Hello, this is John MacArthur. Um, i here with uh, Dave Vellante. It's uh, March 6th, uh, 2012, and we're here for a Pure Insight. Um, uh, we're talking to, we're gonna be talking today to Wolfgang Gerlich. Uh, Wolfgang is joining us from Munder Capital where he's Information Systems and Security Manager. Um, and so I first want to remind everyone that uh, we're going to have all of the lines on mute for the first part of the discussion, then we'll open up the lines in, uh, in uh, just a few minutes after we get some sort of opening comments from Wolfgang. So Wolfgang, you and I met um, back about, I don't know, three, four, five years ago, something like that. I can't remember. And at the time, you were running um, uh, IT infrastructure from under capital. And now you've moved into a, uh, you, you've got not only responsibility for uh, the IT infrastructure, but you've also got uh, uh, responsibility for applications. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that journey for you, and, and then I want to get into a discussion of how DevOps has sort of impacted the way in which you've approached uh, application management. Definitely, definitely. Well, first, Sean, thanks for having me on. You know, I've been looking at the lineup. It's, uh, it's quite impressive what you guys have been doing with Wikibon Pure Insights. So it's a real pleasure to be here with everyone today. Yeah, I work uh, Yeah, I work with a Michigan-based investment management firm. You know, right off the top, I need to say the standard disclaimer. Uh, you know, anything I say is my own opinion. It um, doesn't reflect my employer. That said, I was hired aboard in 2005, originally as, uh, as the systems guy for IT security, and my role was in rationalizing IT um, in certain areas, such as sort of virtualization, storage, and what have you. So I stepped a good, um, good track record. I was the bridgehead between IT and application development and our investment operations team. I do have a bit of a software development background, so it was, uh, it was a natural progression for me. Then in 2008, I took responsibility for the network operations side of the house. Um, and in doing that, we had a lot that needed to be done. We were going through a, a radical virtualization period, um, both in terms of server side and storage. We were really re-architecting everything that, uh, that had been put in for the past decade from the ground up. So we knew we had to take a different approach. We knew we had to do something unique. I started looking at the um, principles of Agile back then and started looking at different ways that we could get out of the and more of the traditional IT operations role of quarterly installs and more into an agile mindset of we're making a change every single day and we're doing those changes in a way that doesn't impact anything. And you're doing this on the infrastructure side, not on the application side? Uh, the infrastructure side starting in 2008, yes, that's right. correct. That's correct. So we built up a real good uh, reputation for being able to deliver, a real good reputation for operational excellence. Um, and that was recognized, and in 2010, they came to me and said, yeah, you know, the thing you're doing with the um, operations side, yeah, can you do that for our software team? So in summer 2010, I lost what I call my one team, one system initiative, where we actually broke down the barriers between operations, broke down the barriers between um, software development, merged everyone into one team under one umbrella, and then moved forward. So that's me in a nutshell. So, did did they did you have an agile application development environment as well before you took over joint responsibility? Not before we did have um, a more responsive software infrastructure. Um, I'm sorry, a software process than other firms. Uh, we are a, a smaller business, so we got. Uh, very close contact with the customers. So we did going in have a more responsive um, SDLC than other organizations, but we weren't really agile. And furthermore, we were tripping up in many key areas. One of the metrics I track is um, backed out changes. So what, what, is, what is that metric again? Backed out changes. So in other words, okay. you put a change in place, and because of the scope, because of the technology, for whatever reason, um, that change has to be backed out. So okay. the percentage of successful changes to backed out changes. Okay. 
and how was that trending? And in before we did this, before we merged the two teams, about 17 percent of all changes that were put in had to be backed up. Today it's down to four. So if you think about that in terms of what I'm focusing on with reducing friction of work, if every week you know, one in five changes you did last week, you have to back out and redo. It's really slowing down your momentum. It's adding a lot of friction to the work. And it's creating a lot of friction between the software team and the rest of the business because they're thinking, well, I asked these guys to do this, and now they have to redo it all. Right, right. So, Wolfgang, this is Dave Vellante. When I, when I, um, when I think of DevOps, um, it's sort of a new concept to many people. So I wonder if you could share with the audience, you know, what is this DevOps thing anyway? Absolutely, absolutely. With regard to DevOps, at its very fundamental level, it's about joining development and joining operations. It's very fundamental when we look at DevOps for our team. It's about reducing friction and increasing velocity. So there's several principles that uh, that come into play with DevOps. The main ones in our environment would be things like teamwork, um, continuous integration, where we're pushing changes to production on a very regular, very quick basis, um, continuous improvement, deep automation, where as opposed to the traditional way in the operation side where you're doing a lot of manual activities such as racking a server, installing a software stack, what have you, now we're viewing the infrastructure as um, almost as code, right, where you've got a package, a build package that you're pushing out to production and you're maintaining those packages over time. So it's really about combining the best of both, dis uh, both disciplines, taking the best of, of both groups, both communities, and with any luck, building something that is better than some of its parts. One of the uh, practices that I hear is uh, in, in DevOps is that the people who build it also have to support it. Um, is that, is that something that you're uh, implementing? Absolutely, absolutely, right? You know, you, you want someone to, a developer to care about operations, put them on, on call. When we merged the teams, when I did the one team, one system, that was one of the first things we did. We completely restructured front-end support before there were several numbers that our uh, user community had to call, depending on what application they were maintaining. So we completely redid the support structure so it's all under one phone number. We redid the email support, so it's all under one email address. And that email goes out to the systems folks, and it goes out to the software folks. There's no distinction. So every night, every on-call cycle, we've got one guy from systems, one guy from software development, up making sure things are humming and running. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I've been involved, as many of us have, in a lot of software development projects. And I just think of the, you know, the, the, the expectation that it's going to be late, the fear of making any changes once it's deployed, um, problems that you run into uh, where you go to the developer and you know he or she will tell you, well, it's working fine for me. Um, right. Are, 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 does DevOps address all those problems? And you know, what's your experience been? It's definitely something that needs to be addressed. It's definitely a cultural thing. We were a little bit fortunate in my environment because when I was hired aboard initially in 2005, you know, they used to call me the, uh, the agent of chaos. Wherever I went, I was changing things. So we had a lot of stuff that had to be changed. Um, so we had to get over that mentality of, you know, it's infrastructure, don't change it, don't reboot that server, it's fragile, it's brittle, leave it alone. We had to break outside that mentality to move forward. And once we broke out of that mentality, and especially in 2008 when I took on the role of uh, managing network operations. And we had a lot of momentum on the operation side for constantly changing things and doing those changes in a way that had a very minimal impact to the infrastructure. And when there were impacts, and this is the key thing, uh, the key discipline change is, if you're in a traditional model, you don't want to change anything. So it's very tight on change management. Change as few things as possible and change as many things as once, so your window of risk is very low. When you're in a continuous integration model, you're the complete opposite change as many things as, as possible, but change one at a time, and be, in a, be very, very good, not at holding up changes, but be very, very good at addressing any impact, any fallout from those changes. So reduce your mean time to repair. So we've gotten to the point where we are pushing out changes um, very frequently, 
any issues because we've got the software side and the infrastructure side coming together. Uh, we can rally around, drill in, and tackle it from all angles and really recover much, much faster than we ever could before. So do you track that metric mean time to repair? Absolutely, absolutely we do. So and it's been going down a couple percentage points, um, you know, year over year ever since we put this in place. Unfortunately, I don't have metric on mean time to, be, to repair before I initiated a one team, one system because that was my metric being tracked. Okay, so so we don't have the before and after picture, but you can track it since you implemented it. Correct. Yeah, and 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 how is that trended? So it's coming down, but 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 how? What's the what's the mean time to repair now? Well, so one second. I'm sorry. I'm just calling in on my cell phone on this, and I got beeped in. Sorry about that. That's okay. You guys, you guys still have me though, yeah? You're, yeah, you're on the help desk, right? The, yes, sir. Give the <laughs> IT manager a pager. Uh, that, is a, that, is a, that is a scary thought. But, um, no, so the question was how quick are we getting at repair? You know, so have you guys heard the Chaos Monkey story from Netflix? Uh, why, don't you tell it to, why don't you tell it to the community? Sure, sure. So this is a pretty cool story. So it's what um, Netflix does, you know, they back in on Amazon, right? They back in on Amazon, they got a whole bunch of services, a whole bunch of servers, um, and they're constantly streaming video. They can't obviously break because people are now treating them as a cable company. So what they have is a process they call the Chaos Monkey. What the Chaos Monkey does is it says, that server over there, rebooted. That service over there, stop. That thing, you know, that's running, that's key to the system, broke. And it's constantly going through an impacting system. So what happens is, when you build your services, when you build your application stack, you're now building for the fact that, you know, I don't want to let the chaos one to get me, right? Because you don't want to be the one in the meeting the next day in the morning, you know, build meeting going, yeah, that thing, that outage, that was me. You don't want to be the guy who the chaos monkey got. Um, so because of that, they built a very robust stack. And when you saw things like the rolling outages that Amazon had last year, um, you know, I was still up. I was still watching my, uh, my videos on Netflix. So it enabled them to build something very robust. And I think every organization has a chaos monkey, whether whether you purposely built one or whether or not, you know, whether you've inherited it from your vendors. And in our environment, you know, we, we always have those things breaking. A uh, story I like to tell is, so in our old data center, we've new data centers, but in our old data center, we had a UPS unit go. The UPS unit went, and we had centralized power distribution. The so UPS went, and it didn't just turn off. It dumped bad power for a period of about eight hours onto all my infrastructure. Um, so if you didn't have everyone on mute right now, you'd hear gasps of panic for any IT operations person on the line. Because that's just horrible. That is a, <laughs> a very, very bad place to be in. And over the next four weeks, we had servers break. We had... Um, circuits break, routers break, switches, any component, HVAC units, any component you can think was impacted. So we had our, our very own for free chaos monkey. And as we're going through this and things are popping off left and right, um, for a period of about four weeks, roughest four weeks <laughs> of my career here at this firm, we had a total of 15 minutes of downtime. 15 minutes of downtime. And that downtime happened when one of our, the primary fail, we fell over to the backup, we had the replacement unit in, we had the um, replacement unit configured, we had a guy literally standing there waiting um, to put that unit in place. At the same time, that's on the engineering side, on the same time, we had one of our software analysts who knows the staff, knows the business, who's talking to the business, trying to figure out the right time to time that downtime, when to do it, what to happen. And we were able to coordinate that 15 minutes downtime such that between the software analysts and my engineering folks, it had zero impact on the business. We stopped trades for a very brief period over that one partner. We replaced the equipment. We kept running. So I think of something like that. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish your thought, please. I think of something like that going through effectively a landmine um, 
IT infrastructure for a period of time, we could not do that um, without the synergy that DevOps brings, without the fact that the IT folks know what each component means to the business because of the software analysts, and the software folks know what each component means to their stack because of the engineering team. And anyone who's had to go into it knows that's a very painful process and it was made significantly less painful because of our low mean time to repair and the collaboration between the two groups. Yeah, so that's a, a clear example of a you know, positive business outcome due to Dev, from DevOps. I, um, and I know you don't have uh, the, the before on the mean time to repair, but I wonder if you could talk about the impact on, on staff. You know, the title of this Peer Insight was Achieving Hyper Productivity. Um, either data that you have in your existing environment or just based on your experience. Can you talk a little bit about the staff requirements in total? And, and then I'd love to hear more about what the skill sets are. But start with, I mean, it, what you just described, you know, to have that type of recovery is quite complex in a typical IT environment and would make, take a lot of people. Talk a little bit about, you know, the number of folks that you have and what kind of productivity you're achieving. That's a very good point. We've got, uh, we definitely have a tiger team of, of uh, individuals. It's a very small group. We've got three software analysts. We've got three systems engineers. And uh, we've got one person who, you know, sits on that line between those two. And then, of course, they roll up to me as the uh, information systems manager. And then we've got one gentleman on the help desk. So it's a very lean infrastructure, very lean uh, uh, staff. And how, many, and, yeah, and how many applications are you supporting there? So when I took on the role, we were supporting 317 custom applications and uh, 57 in-house applications, or I'm sorry, shrink wrap and software as a service applications. We're right now going through a consolidation phase similar to um, what I did with the infrastructure in terms of identifying a couple buckets, refactoring everything so that the existing system becomes smaller and becomes more rationalized. And uh, last year, we were able to bring that number down to 272, so that's 317 to 272 applications. So you're talking about nine FTEs. In your experience, you know, for the types of workloads and applications that you're managing, you know, what would it take with a traditional approach? Well, I'll tell you, before we went down this path, we had... Um, Let's see, we had anywhere, we had four people on a web development team on the software side. We had three people on line of business on the software side, anywhere from two to four consultants. Um, so what's that, seven plus two to four. On the engineering side, we had three people on the help desk, and we had six people on the engineering side. So previously, circa 20 or 2002, um, 2008, that was our staffing size. So that was about 26 to 28 FTEs, depending on how many consultants you had at that point in time. Correct. Down, correct. down to nine. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what have you done on the training side to, 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 to support a highly optimized team here? Right, right. So on the training side, just to step back one step, um, when we talk about cutting things, you know, everyone's got their own their own best practice. But one person's best practice, not necessarily the best approach for your organization. So the lens that we use for um, determining value proposition, where to cut, where to focus, is um, is a very simple Venn diagram, right? So we've got a, a simple Venn diagram value prop, and that has three circles. One is what's driving business value, you know, what's saving me money or what's helping my business units make money. So what's one circle business value, the second circle is what gets my people fired up, what gets them excited, what makes them challenged at work, um, really puts them in their zone in terms of productivity. So that's the second ring. And then the third ring is what are they skilled at, what's their expertise, what is their, um, you know, their knowledge. So if you look at um, business value, passion, excitement, skill, and knowledge, you look at that last ring, the skill and knowledge, Really, one of the, the key techniques I use as a manager is to grow that ring as large as possible. And the way we do that is 20% um, of the time, 20% of any given week, that's about one day a week, right, is going towards 
training. So going towards acquiring the skills, going towards um, cross-training between software and the operations side, um, going towards making that ring as big as possible, making our people know exactly what they need to do, and such that when we go to commit something, we've already done it, we know what has to happen, we can put it in a very um, professional and smooth and seamless fashion. And so by, by growing that ring, that expertise ring, what, what's the residual effect on the business value ring? Hmm. So the residual effect is that as the business value can shift, uh, we are in a good position with our existing team to keep our finger on the pulse. So by growing that ring, you know, training um, enables my team to focus today on where the business value is and enables my team to sustain business value as that the business value shifts over time. And we see that shift happen all the time. You know, I actually started consulting in this firm in the mid-90s, and back then it was kind of interesting. The IT folks were still assembling their own desktops and servers. So they buy a bunch of parts, put it together, and that was your server, that was your desktop. You know, and, and in the 90s, that was a great value pot because there's 30% margin right there that you're saving, and, you know, you could easily pay for your salary doing that. Um, and then, of course, in the late 90s, early 2000s, they were building data centers. So they built a data center that uh, was the one that I talked to you about the power went out that we've now moved out of. And then 2002, you know, we had a web development team. So each one of these times, there is value, and there's value to build your own desktop. There's value to build your own data centers. There's value to build your own website from hand with a team of developers. And, of course, today that value is dissipated. There's no value anymore. There's very low margin on equipment. Um, very low margin with very low value in maintaining facilities. And web development can be, you know, there's, there's frameworks left and right to do that. So by maintaining the training, keeping that ring as large as possible as the business value shifts, I can transition my team and my focus from one area to the other. So are these the same people? Oftentimes it is. So interestingly enough, my top business intelligence guy, which is one of the buckets I'm focusing in on, on business intelligence, SharePoint, and uh, basically not my problem software as a service. One of my top business intelligence guys is one of the original web development team. So we're able to transition those skills over time. Um, on the infrastructure side, a story I like to tell is uh, when I joined this firm in 2005, about that same time, a um, good friend of mine joined an automotive. So he joined an automotive. I joined a financial service, and we were, we were talking about it at the time. And they had group-wise, we had group-wise, right? Well, our end users couldn't stand group-wise, couldn't stand it. They're in open revolt about it, didn't like it. They came to IT. IT says, oh, group-wise is stable, it's reliable, you know, we know it, we're going to stick with group-wise. The same conversation happened in the automotive. Well, they don't like group-wise. Well, the IT folks are in transit. That's the right way to go. So is the big training. Oh, good. Sorry. Hmm? Go ahead, sorry. Due to training, due to evaluating things from a business value perspective and from an interest perspective, I sat down with the guy who was doing email. Well, what's the story in this? What, what, what is it you really do? And we determined that what he really did was enable communication to collaborations. And, you know, it really didn't matter what communication or technology that was, right? Was it supplies? Was it exchange? What really mattered at the end of the day was he was delivering value and he had the skills to do what his job title was. So we were able to transition him to SharePoint, uh, move the management of um, exchange out for significantly less than the salary that, uh, you know, of an exchange administrator. And we partnered with someone and, and got that done and off our plate. So I contrast the, my friend at the automotive, those systems administrators, three of them, their title right was group-wise administrator. Their role was group-wise administrator. They dug, dug their feet in. They drug their feet, you know, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. And so I was talking to him, um, my friend, maybe a couple months ago, and he goes, you know what happened? So I was, I was teasing him about still being group-wise. He goes, you know what happened? Goes, well, what happened? He goes, Microsoft called. And they didn't call the IT guy. They didn't call the help desk. You know who they called? Well, who did they call? They called the C-level. Microsoft calls on the C-level and says, hey, why are you guys still on group-wise? Well, our guys tell us we can't get off of it. Well, why? Well, they say group-wise or, you know, Outlook is too slow. Not here, have a free account. Go play with it. 
I'm like, hey, it's not. It's perfect. It's exactly what we need. They talk to the group. I goes, well, we can't do it because if you do that, your information is going to be at risk. We can't migrate it, blah, blah, blah. So they go back to Microsoft. Well, our guys tell us we can't do it because we lose our email. Is that really a problem? Hmm, it turns out it wasn't. <laughs> they, they dumped all their old email. They poured the emails. They needed rekeyed contacts, um, which, you know, is debatable whether or not they to do that. Dump the email system and let go of those three group-wise administrators. So, you know, you have to be training. You have to be keeping business value. And the days where you could drag your feet and be in transit are, are definitely over. Um, and this scenario is a job-ending decision not to train, not to keep sharp, not to focus on business value. So it's quite likely a career. I mean, can you try, imagine trying to find a job today in 2012 with the title of group-wise administrator for six years? Right. Uh, Conference recording has stopped. Oops. Got it back on. Okay, well, I think I, I've just unmuted everybody. And it okay. Coincidentally, did, stopped the recording. Did but you that's start okay. the recording again? Or? That's okay. Don't worry. We have the recording. Oh, we have here. it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so we wanted to open up the uh, lines to... Uh, uh, to any questions that we might have from the Wikibon community. Yeah, by the way, if you want to tweet us at Wikibon uh, or uh, 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 at DeVellante, I'm monitoring the, the Twitter stream, but uh, I've just opened up the lines. I know I know some folks had some some questions, so uh, fire away. Just let us know your name. I had a question. Go ahead. Who's this? This is Bill Petro from Cisco. Hey, Bill. And my question Hello. is this. In, in moving toward... DevOps optimization, do you use any automation or cloud management technologies? Ah, yes. Yes, I do. And this is one of the areas that it's always a little touchy whether you want to say, because again, you know, a best practice is my best approach. And I know there's some fantastic automation tools out there. You know, some people are really awesome at Puppet, some people are really awesome at Chef. We are primarily a Microsoft house. Um, as a matter of fact, that was one of the main things I did when I came on board was get a soft mobile network and, and a bunch of different platforms onto Microsoft. And so what we use is Microsoft System Center Suite. So we use the um, System Center Orchestra that's going in right now for orchestration and automation. We've got Configuration Manager in for pushing out packages of OSs and applications, um, the ticketing stack, the, the whole nine yards. What's nice about System Center 2 is with the new console, it will manage my environment in-house as well, so my private cloud side it manages, as well as managing my public cloud side. So anything I have in Azure versus anything I have internally is managed to that single pane of glass. So let me go down one click. Uh, so I heard you, you do use automation technology and specifically Microsoft's uh, to what extent are you managing your private internal cloud? Uh, to what extent are you using the external? Are you bursting between them, or you just have internal and external for different reasons? Yeah, I've, I've heard a great, a great uh, term of on the base, you know, least the spike, which is an interesting approach. In terms of our infrastructure today, what I'm doing is um, most everything is still in my private infrastructure. Uh, the reason for that is we've got a very ouch. we've got a very stable load pattern, so I don't need that bursting capability. And there's also being in the financial industry, there's still some regulatory concerns about putting things on the public cloud. So at the moment, I am with public cloud where I was with virtualization, say, circa 2003. Now I've got it in place. I can test it. We're using it for specific use cases, but we haven't moved to the point of like virtualization today where it's crossed everything. Great, thanks so much. Okay. Not a problem. That, that's a good question because I saw a stat that many organizations are holding off moving to the cloud today. They interviewed IT managers and the number one reason was 67% of the people said they were concerned their staff does not have the skill set to do public cloud. And that to me is huge. That's like saying 60% of the people are saying, I don't train my people, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> you know? 
it, it's a thing to be in. So we took a very strong look at a number of management tools, set it on System Center, and one of the main reasons is everything that my people are learning today, all the skill sets, all the management opportunities, will transfer very seamlessly as that public cloud option expands. So is that a recommendation then that you use the same set of tools for private and public cloud management? 100%. You, especially if you have a small staff, you don't want to be maintaining three, four, or five different sets of tools depending on where you are. Now it goes back to my concept of one system, one team. We want to manage everything as one system, regardless of who is responsible for it on the team, regardless of where the infrastructure is. If it's in my place, if it's in Microsoft, or wherever it is, we want to be looking at it as one unified system. So if you okay, so if you were selecting a cloud provider, then you would exclude them if it required a different management interface. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Point solutions when you've got a small team, it's it's just adds friction to the work. Um, this is David. So I've got one question on your virtualization strategy. Um, what what's been your uh, approach to that, and how have you tried to simplify? Uh, the Microsoft, uh, the environment, Microsoft environment virtual, in a virtualization environment. Yeah, so we virtualized from the time I stepped foot in the door in 2005 to the time I'm on the phone with you today. We went from 140 servers to 43 servers. And uh, that's just been a huge drop, and that's one of the things that allowed us to move into a managed data center and get out of the facilities business. Our technique towards virtualization has been Let's take a look at you know, baby steps. Let's first do um, one platform, because when I joined, we actually had four or five different virtualization techniques deployed as point solutions. So I went through a bake-off, selected Microsoft virtualization. We we're on the RFC early adopter program for that. Now we've got one platform, let's do dev and test through it. Now that we've got dev and test followed through it, let's do our tier two, tier one, just came in. So we, we really took baby steps and Tier 1 went in last year um, with Hyper-V R2. So that was 143 down to 43 servers? 140 down to 43, yes. 140 down to 43. Huge cut. And I'm looking to do the exact same thing with applications. <laughs> you, you want to take it down by, by two-thirds? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah, if you look at those 317 applications, I touched briefly on it earlier, but I've got three buckets I'm separating them all into. It's, you know, it's either SharePoint, because um, a lot of the things that we had created in the past can now be configured with a couple clicks in SharePoint. Um, Microsoft BI stack, which has got a whole suite of tools for data integration, reporting, analytics, and again, were things that we had created as one-off for the past decade. And then the third stack is not my problem, which is things that I can move off to software as a service, that I can use a shrink wrapped application, um, things that we built and have continued to maintain. However, the people who request them are no longer with the firm. You know, things that are no longer being used. So I'm really looking at skinning that 317 number closer down to 100. Okay. When you started this initiative, this DevOps initiative, did you look at you know, who was doing a good job in the marketplace? I mean, is there a reference model out there? Like, uh, I mean, I'm just making up like a Zynga or, you know, other organizations that you tried to model yourself after, or was it more sort of you had to invent it yourselves? Yeah, it was more sort of that we had to invent it ourselves. You know, now there's DevOps as a model was that Patrick Dubois had the inaugural conference in 2009. But by the time DevOps was really picking up speed, I was already knee deep in implementing one team, one system. So it's almost been interesting because we've been developing side by side with the DevOps movement. So I've been keeping a very good close on that, watching you know what's been uh, evolving, listening to the podcast. But I think in terms of DevOps and why I think this movement has legs is really what we did was we said, okay, what makes sense? for us, for our business, for our organization, uh, what makes sense in terms of keeping our people very sharp, keeping them very motivated, running a lean staff, and yet really keeping tight alignment with the business. And once we figure that out, everything else flows from it naturally. So 
in doing that, it's very interesting that I would come up with a model and we look and go, oh, yeah, that company over there is doing something very comparable. So I think that it's one of those things that, you know, just like television or microwave, you know, the minute the ground is laid and the culture is right, you know, it's, the time is right. So I have, an, I have another question from somebody on Twitter asking, um, what is the profile of a typical person who is a, a DevOps superstar? What, what about that, Wolfgang? Is, is that what you're looking for? Are you looking for DevOps superstar? Or are you looking for somebody who's a utility infielder? Can you describe that individual? Do you hire them or do you yeah. grow them? <laughs> the, the superstar, the superstar. Let me tell you things about superstar. From a, have a, a DevOps superstar who works on my software side does a, a three main things. Obviously, he's very good at his role in terms of the technology he's deployed. He knows his craft. Um, he takes an artisan approach. He makes sure that things go in in a very good quality way. But yet, he does not just limit himself to saying, this is my sandbox, and everyone else stay in your own area. Um, cuts across boundaries, knows infrastructure, knows security, which is critical to me because I can't be out um, implementing the security for you know, every, everyone else. Right? It's got to be a team effort. So no security. And most importantly, um, takes responsibility for their input. So what I mean by that is I think in a traditional IT team, maybe perhaps too much time is spent on managing someone's inputs, like you know, give me your time sheet, give me your form, uh, make sure you're in at this time, you leave at that time, you know, et cetera, as opposed to the outputs, which is are we hitting our marks? Is the customer satisfied? Is our metrics heading in the right direction? Are we getting stuff done? So a DevOps superstar is someone who has enough understanding of the big picture to hold in their mind, very sharp skill set on their particular technology that they are working with, and it takes ownership and pride in what they do and holds themselves to a very high standard. So of, of the hundred of 317 apps that you had plus the 57 others, um, you talked about this not my problem set. So you've moved those all off to third party providers or you've shut a bunch down. Um, how, do, how do third parties play into this? So we moved uh, a number off. One of the big not my problems at the moment is the website <laughs> because um, previously we had built the website utilizing a framework where we built a lot of customization on it that is now available right out of the box. So I'm in the middle of an initiative to set up a new website to um, move off the ownership, the development and operations of that website to a third party. So that's a good example. The um, things like email, email archive. Really, if you think of those three circles, right, the hot spot, the point where you get velocity is when you've got the nexus of business value, there's team skills, that their passion. Anything outside that is primed to say, can we automate it? Can we minimize it? Can we move it to a third party? So a couple of, a couple of folks who have some questions. I know Email is being hosted off site. Uh, uh, hold on one second. Is that is that Clint? Yeah, yeah I was just asking him what the email is being hosted right now off premises. Uh, is your email off prem now? No, no, it is not. We've got we do have a number of regulations in our environment that we've got to be very careful with. We partner with a company who prides themselves, they call it cloud convenience on-site or on-premise security. I, I love that concept. So our email is in-house. Uh, we are responsible for the care and feeding of the servers, which is minimal thanks to automation. Uh, and they take care of the maintenance, the patching, the any tickets that come through. So it's on-prem. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Clint. And, and, uh I know uh, Joe Martins has a question. Joe, Joe, are you there? Oh, hey, thanks, Dave. Sure. Uh, Joe Martins, Data Mobility Group. Uh, Wolfgang, the, one of the things that we've been looking at over the last few years is the DevOps mentality across vendors. Because within organizations, um, you know, it's easy or easier, I think, to try to you know, bring several of your teams under one umbrella and get them on the same page. But one of the things that we've been trying to uh, uh, beat the drum about is, for example, going to a company like an Adobe and saying, guys, if you understood infrastructure and the way that things 
uh, are backed up today or the way that they could be done if your applications were developed in a different way, then you could leverage that. So, mm -hmm. you know, for example, in information management, they, uh, when you have a lot of interdependent systems, uh, it's not very easy for the IT vendors to try to figure out how do we back that up with what we've got today. And instead, getting you know the app developers to better understand how things could be done and reinvent or rework their applications to then be easier to maintain, more cost-effective to maintain. And I'm wondering kind of what your thoughts are on you know that as a future direction for both the IT app developers and the business app developers, given what you've been doing within the company. Yeah. Let's, let's make that happen. But they don't, you know, they, they don't seem to want to do it. Even I, I've talked to within IBM, within HP, and if you talk to their software group and you talk to their hardware group, they will act like you're invisible. You know, yeah. they really, they just don't have an interest, it seems, uh, in making that happen. You know, the IT guys that develop the hardware and the apps to manage the hardware, they're kind of going along their merry way and kind of, you know, happy with the way things are going. And the app guys, the business app guys, you know, developing, let's say, the, the uh, Adobe's creative products, they're kind of, hey, here's this monster I've created, and now you're responsible for manage, managing it. Have fun. You're you know, absolutely versus, perfect. Yeah. So uh, do you think, though, that it's reasonable? I, I mean, given what you've been able to achieve, I, I think it's reasonable, and I think it's needed. I mean, you, if I think of my operational concerns, you know, the chaos monkeys I get for free with the product, the chaos monkeys I get for free with the product all come from companies that do not quite understand the operation side of things, that have built a product that um, probably works very good. I've got one, and unfortunately it's a key line of business application, that they always say, well, just install everything on one server. Well. That works if you've got five users, but it doesn't work if you've got, you know, 500 users. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's a good point. Oh, okay. And every time I get on the phone with any of them, I've got to explain again, we're clustering as with DNS, you know, I, so I'm, I'm right there with you, I'm right there with you. Oh, that, that oh, a good so, example. So good to hear. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, the, and, and it's not just the vendors, right, it's also the consultants. I mentioned um, this, this was a classic, classic conversation. So I was, we're in the process of outsourcing our, our website. We're meeting with the developers are going to build this code, and of course this company is not going to take operational responsibility for it. And I had you know, one of my DevOps guys, he's a software guy, he's in there, and he built some of the original code. And we had the new guy, and the new guy goes, okay, well, I'm really concerned about some of these security requirements that Walt King asked for. So, okay, let's put it and the concerns he was concerned about, or the concerns he had, rather, was about validating inputs. And he goes, well, if I'm getting this data from you, shouldn't it all be good? And my guy gave him, a, seriously, the withered look. He, he was polite. He was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me that you weren't planning to make sure that if you expected a number, we sent you a number. If you expected a string, we sent you a string. And you're telling me that you weren't planning on having some thresholds in that if yesterday I had 100 funds and today I have zero, you're just going to delete all those funds off the website without checking with someone? He goes, this is all code we built. This, this, if this isn't in there, we're going to have one or two really bad days next year when something goes sideways. And the guy started thinking, about it, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, I, I can see that. But consultants, vendors, you know, they ship and they're done. There's, there's no skin in the game. They got your money, they're done. Um, whereas internal DevOps, our guys have skin in the game. You know, those one or two bad days are going to be felt by my team. And because of that, my developers are very cognizant about doing a quality job, and they built logic around to make sure we don't have a bad day. Let's, uh, let's just check and see if there are any other questions in the community here. Okay. Uh, Wolfgang, for there, there, there are people like you who are fairly far down the path on DevOps, and then there are people who are hearing a lot of the buzz, and now they're hearing the results that you're achieving. 
what's your recommendation on first steps? What's the order in which you go down the DevOps path? Well, first steps are to, it all depends on where your role is, but first step if you're a developer is to reach out to the operations folks. You know, one of the things that might be fun is if you're not on call, put yourself on the on-call rotation, sit in on a couple um, root cause analysis meetings. If you're an infrastructure person, to sit on a couple build meetings, get a sense of what type of um, features they're building, what type of pressures they're under, you know, write some code, and start breaking down those barriers between the two teams. In terms of management, the process I followed was to build very strong bottom-up support when I brought, came in, I was originally a consultant. It allowed me to cut across boundaries, cut across the silos, just get things done. And I continued that when I had the network operations group. So building that bottom-up support and building that um, groundswell, whereas we went to make this change, not everyone was on board with it. It was just a logical progression. So if you start establishing, establishing the track record of saying, you know, I don't care if it's your problem or my problem, now it's our problem, and we're going to work together to, to fix it. I think you're, you're farther ahead. Um, at the same time, of course, you know, the analogy I like to use is a sailboat, right? You want to go sailing, um, you got to put the boat in the water, you got to have wind in your sails. Putting the boat in the water is your executive support. Wind in your sails is the support of your team. So if you don't have your executive support, you're not going to be able to make some of the changes at the top in terms of, um, in terms of staffing, in terms of budgets, all those types of changes, you're not going to be able to make those seamlessly and smoothly. So at the same time, you need to start demonstrating to executive management, you know, why this makes business sense. It's one thing to say, yeah, we've got a culture of teamwork. We've got a culture where people can work with their strongest, you know. We've got a culture of letting people say, hey, take a fitness for approach, wake up in the morning and say, I know what we're going to do today and go do something awesome. That's really not going to fly if you can't tie that to a business initiative, show some cost savings, and, and show really what that means to the organization. So, so can we flesh that out a little bit in terms of that business case? Sure. So you, you, know, you talked about cost savings. Uh, we've been talking about flexibility. To, to, to talk to us like you pitched it to your management. How did you sell them on this? Well, one thing we did right off the bat was establish from day one a very – good track record of saying it's going to be done in six months, it's done in six months. Or it used to take a, a month, now we had, you know, it took us one week. So we built a very strong track record, um, both me with my original infrastructure, then me with the network operations team of delivering very quickly, very effectively, which is why they asked us to do the, the software side. And my team, my management team is, is very good at saying, you guys know what you're doing. We trust you to do it. So they do give us a lot of leeway there. But in terms of training, in terms of the way we're organizing the team, at the end of the day, it's all about results. So with training, we started very simple. Hey, we've got this project. The training is baked into it. Um, there may be costs. There may not be costs. Here's the results of the project. And again, we built a portfolio of success stories that we could go to them and say, Here's what we're doing. We want to expand the training. Now, last time we bought a book, now we want to send to a class, for example. And here's the return on investment. Here's how, you know, the impact of the project. So all that culminated in um, probably probably the coolest success story of last year was we actually had a business acquisition. And uh, it was quite a magic trick, I think. We had, a, we had this business acquisition. We had to integrate them into our platform. And the trick was we couldn't touch the infrastructure or do anything, make any visible signs, obviously, until the deal was signed, until the day the deal was inked. That's pretty standard. The non-standard thing was the minute the deal was inked, between then and end of business, we had to get them on our trading platform. So we had to integrate effectively an entire acquisition in one day. Um, and then, of course, we had other phases beyond that. But to be able to go ahead and do that, and in some of the meetings, so if they would go well, what are some of the concerns about the on the IT side? And my CFO will go, you know, I've got no concerns on my on the IT side. Wolf and his team are going to do their IT SWAT team approach. They're going to drop in a branch off in the box. They're going to wire them up to you know our private cloud. It's just going to happen. I've got confidence, and they have that confidence. 
Why? Because we built that track record and that portfolio of success stories. Good. Great. You mentioned um, I detect a slight frustration with the vendors just sort of um, shipping, being ship, shipping it and, done, and being done. Um, yeah. What would you like to see the vendor community do differently? I would like to see the vendor community, in terms of vendor support specifically, uh, take more of a DevOps approach. You know, a lot of times when something is broke, it has to be very, you know it's very, very bad as an IT manager when you hear from your team, they're getting the developers involved. Uh, because usually that means that, you know, it's drug on for a very long time, they can't get it solved, that's when the development team um, gets engaged. So it would be nice if there could be closer coordination between software development and the support function such that the software development of the vendor is feeling the pain of the customer. Okay. Um, did you end up having to consolidate budgets as you went through this process, was it, or was it already a single budget? No, it was, it was two different budgets. We consolidated the budget as part of one team, one system. And that's about what a twelve-month process, or yeah, yeah, twelve months. Yeah. Budget cycle to budget cycle. Right. The um, can we just talk a little bit more about any other sort of key metrics that you use in reporting back to management? Um, if I'm about to go down a DevOps path, for example, what are the things that I should be measuring before I sort of kick this off to? And what would I compare myself to, um, to say, to go to management saying, this is why I want to do this? Uh, implemented changes. So how frequently are you changing? You, know, you don't have to be Amazon. I think Amazon pushes changes every 11 to 12 seconds. So you don't have to be Amazon. Uh, but you do want to know how frequently you're pushing changes so that you can begin pushing that number up. In our environment, we're averaging 46 changes a month. So a couple changes a day. You want to know how many of those changes are successful. So that's the metric of um, successful changes to fail right. changes. Right. Backed out changes. You want to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, back out. You want to be able to measure things such as um, help desk tickets related to changes and help desk tickets not related to changes. So I put a change in, maybe didn't get backed out, but it created a whole bunch of incidents over the next six months or three months. So you want to be able to track that so that you know, A, you're doing more, B, you're doing better. And then the third thing is you want to be able to track customer satisfaction, however you want to track that either by um, change surveys, periodic single surveys, what have you. So A, you're doing more, B, you're doing better, and C, most importantly, the business is more satisfied. Okay. And, you know, so the, the phrase is DevOps, but you were more ops dev, although you had some development background. Before you. That's very true. So, so why is it DevOps instead of Ops Dev? Well, I think it's DevOps because many infrastructure teams are still in the mentality of don't reboot that server ever. Something bad may happen. Uh, don't change the technology that I love because I'm really good at it. Uh, don't do patches because patches will break things and we'll get tickets. We had to break out of that mentality in our organization in order to move forward, in order to heavily virtualize, in order to standardize an OS, in order to outsource the data center and move to a private cloud. We had to be changing things all the time, every time. Is, is virtual, so yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. So I mentioned, you know, I was called the you know, agent of chaos, agent of change when I was brought in, because that's pretty much how the director introduced me when he initially hired me. Um, here's Wolfgang, he's here to change things. Yeah. So we had to adopt an agile mentality such that we're changing things all the time. And in doing so, when we merged in software development, they took some of our approach, such as ITIL and some of the service level management. We took a lot more of their approach, such as how they're managing the, the backlog and how they're tying the changes in. So there's really a lot that everyone can learn from both teams. So you can't go down a DevOps path unless you're prepared to go down a virtualization path, right? Is that... The key thing, not necessarily is the virtualization, I'd say, it's the automation. 
So you've okay. got to be able to deploy OS's, application stacks, builds, packages, what have you, very quickly and in an automated fashion. Um, a term that uh, a, a good friend of mine in the Michigan area in DevOps uses all the time is versioned, um, versioned infrastructure. Mark Stanislav uses that term. So you've got to be able to version your infrastructure, right? You've got to know that you know, this is what my infrastructure was this day, this is what it is today, here's the delta so that I can bring everything up in level sets. And to do that, I find mm -hmm. the easiest way is virtualization. Could you do it with physical hardware? Yeah, probably. It, it might be a little more difficult, but it should be done. I have a, a question. Okay. Uh, um, your name, please? This, uh, my name's Mike Benjamin. Um, does yeah. this really, do, do you think it applies mm -hmm. to organizations of all sizes, or is it really kind of you're able to get the critical mass for a DevOps group because it's of a, you know, kind of right-sized group? If, it, it seems like you're going to have a, a real difficulty scaling this to larger than, say, 10, 12, uh, you know, individual participants, and especially when you cross managers and or, or if you have a 24-hour operation. Have, have you put any, any thought into that or, or maybe not as much because it doesn't apply necessarily directly to your case? Well, we do have 24-hour operation in terms of what the systems are doing, but I see your point. You know, there are some very big DevOps players. Amazon uh, professes to follow DevOps and they're huge, you know, Google. Uh, so there's some very big houses that do have DevOps. I think the limiting factor in my ability to scale up would be my ability to, you know, career manage, know what people are interested in, know how they work, and the system give them the tools so that they are supported to do a good quality job. Um, what is that? Is that six people? Is that 12 people? Is that 20 people? I don't know. You know so that, that is a good question. At some point in time, Obviously, you'd want to break down uh, the DevOps into perhaps a couple different functional groups. Maybe one focusing on line of business apps, one focusing on web apps, whatever that may be. You know, John, um, my and Wolfgang, my big takeaway here. I go back to Wolfgang's Venn diagram. I see DevOps is one part mindset, one part skills and knowledge, and in all parts teamwork, and the results are way lower cost. In your case, you're essentially one third of the costs from a headcount standpoint. Than, than you know previous to DevOps, much more flexibility and, and much greater business value delivery, and so that's sort of my my takeaway and summary. And yeah. I'll pass it back to you, John. Well, Wolfgang, first of all, th thank you very much for being on with us today. I hope you'll uh, help us continue the conversation on uh, on on the Wikibon website, uh, posting articles and starting discussions. Um, we will have up. Um, within the next uh, 48 hours, uh, six uh, uh, research notes on today's call. Um, everyone's welcome to contribute, edit, and enhance the uh, articles and or post uh, one of their own. And then we will send this out to the community uh, again in an email uh, uh, the next week. So thanks very much for being part of the, uh, uh, the thanks very much for being part of the uh, Peer Insight uh, community, and the next Peer Insight is on March 20th, and the topic is, excuse me, <coughs> the rise of 10G Ethernet and the impact impact of Intel's Romley, which was announced uh, today. Which right. was announced today. So yeah. please join us again on the 20th, and thank you very much, Wolfgang. Thanks. Thank you.